This is the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, episode number 112. The practice of information architecture used to be pretty straightforward. You organized a bunch of web pages and created navigation schemes to help readers find their way to the content. Nowadays, websites and apps are more likely to assemble and serve content on the fly. This requires a new approach. Donna Spencer has practiced IA across the lifespan of the discipline and can help you navigate these new ways of structuring and organizing information. Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. Our mission is to democratize content strategy, to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 112 of the Content Strategy Insights Podcast. I am super delighted today to have with us Donna Spencer. Donna is currently a principal product designer at MakerX, but she's been known as an information architect for a long time. I mean, I first discovered her book in, I don't know, 15 years ago, whenever that was. So anyhow, welcome, Donna. Uh, You want to tell the folks a little bit more about what you're up to these days? Uh, Thank you very much. Well, so firstly, I just should, um, you know, disclose that what I'm up to at the moment is painting my new house. So, you know, it's me, safety goals glasses and um and a lot of paint all over me because if anybody's looking at it going why does she look so weird <laughs> that would be one um aside from painting an old house uh because we're talking between christmas and new year so this is the time when you know i'm not thinking much about work um uh as you just said i've just joined a, this little new, new company as a principal product designer and to me that's pretty neat because it shows that I've actually been able to stay on the designer path and reach quite a senior level um, without being um, expected to, you know, go into management. So there aren't um, there actually aren't a lot of places where you can stay senior and stay like being a hands-on designer. So I'm really glad that I'm still able to do that because management was never my path. Um, I am, and I also love that, that this little company I've joined is called Maker X because I always say, like, I am a maker. I make things, which is, again, why I'm painting and renovating this house by myself. And otherwise, like, I sew and weave and I'm all, always making stuff. And to me, designing is, you know, still all of that. Mm-hmm. And a big part of that, I know I've heard you talk about this before, is that um, you're sort of a uh, compulsive organizer, too, which is kind of a foundational thing for information architecture practice and and for a painting project <laughs> I'm going to guess too <laughs> yeah um, yeah yeah I mean, you I know one a, thing a... you've been doing this for a while and I think we've both seen information architecture like I remember vividly when the first edition of the polar bear, bear book came out and reading it cover mm-hmm. to cover and and um, being excited that somebody had articulated what we do but then it's sort of like it never, I don't know, it took off and I think it's always been a thing, but it seems to have been sort of like neglected in some of the past year. But anyhow, so yeah. I think a couple of things about, I'd love to talk a little bit about that, but I'd also love to just get your take, your definition of what information architecture is, because I think a lot of people, because of that neglect, I think there are people mm-hmm. who couldn't, you know, define it for us. So yeah, I'd love to get your take on that. Yeah, look, I still think of it as a thing that is needed to be done, not necessarily by a person with a role of information architect, but something that, you know, needs to be done on most projects where the things we're working with, whether that's kind of, you know, unstructured content on long pages in websites or whether it's um, the data that we're going to be serving up via an API or consuming via an API or whether it's, um, you know, inputs to an algorithm, it's, it's all about like understanding the ideas that we're working with, understanding the content that we're working with, understanding the relationships within all of that, um, and then also understanding how people think about the tasks they need to do or the information they need to find, understanding where they are, and um, putting structures uh, in place so that... Um, you know, we can actually deliver what we need to to the people we need to deliver it to in a way that works for them. And I and like I said that word structures pretty quickly in that definition, but that's really the the important part of it is 
um, doing that underlying foundational work of setting up our data or our content well so that we can deliver it to people, you know, in a fairly automated way. When we first started doing IA, we a lot of us were making, you know, hand-created websites with, with, with simple hierarchies where we had 100 pages and we knew where every page went in a tree. We don't work like that anymore. We're working on large websites um, large apps where we're doing a lot of delivering of content automatically, whether that's advertising or related products or, you know, showing a catalogue. If you, you can't you can't actually deliver that to people unless you have figured out how to structure it first. That was a long definition. It's not a definition, maybe a description. No, and the, but I think that sort of uh, it's a great example of why it can be hard to define it because mm. it is so... Well, it's, it's foundational. It's it, it cuts across all this stuff. So if you had to say all those things you just said to make sure that it was all in there, um, but and but you also alluded in there to the evolution of the practice that that it used to be you know hundred page website. You just figure out how to navigate it, how to label stuff. Boom, you're good to go. Uh, way different now. Can you talk a little bit about the, how how that has evolved? Um, you know, the, the sort of the new activities or new conceptualizations of things that are necessary because of that evolution. Yeah, well, like, and I, this this uh, kind of I had an epiphany when I was teaching a class recently, and I'd been talking all the time about like what I just said there with delivering content automatically, and somebody said, "What do you mean by that?" Um, and I realized that that's really the you know that evolution of. Um, when we, when we started and we were doing a lot of kind of manual work and manual hierarchies and just, you know, kind of setting up um, even, you know, to thousands of pages or tens of thousands of pages of content, but in a kind of manual way. Um, and now, as I said, really what we're doing is trying to figure out how to work with much larger volumes of information um, and how to make that happen using you know, mathematics and algorithms and artificial intelligence and machine learning and things and stuff. Um, uh, you know, you can imagine like a large, you know, any large content or catalogue site, um, you kind of design a template uh, for something like a content page or an index page, and then you write rules around what content is shown here and how. How do the filters work? What is in the filters? What are those categories? And so that evolution um, from doing things quite manually to now like doing this in, in a really automated way, I think has, I mean, it's, 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 it's a different kind of thing that we're working on, but it also is, it's a different kind of set of skills. Um, and there's a third lens on it where most user experience professionals, you know, who are newish to the field um, have been, taught in a really quite different way, being taught about, you know, user needs and they've been taught about screens and flows and, you know, design, doing a journey map and understanding how a person gets from one end to the other of a thing. Um, but they haven't been taught about that kind of structural, you know, how do you make this thing work? Uh, how do you get the content out of the bucket and onto the page? Um, so we've got a, a kind of a big gap there in that the way, you know, teaching has been happening for, for, for UX folks has never helped them understand that there is this real data lens that they need to have. That's right. And that's um, the, the way you just said that makes me think that um, how do you fill that gap, I guess, for the new folks, the, the folks who've come into the discipline? Because you, and I think that's something that like I come out of publishing and, mm -hmm. and I've watched when I reflect on my career, I'm like, I can't identify the day, but over the last 20 years, I've shifted from identifying as a publisher to being a UX designer, oh. you know, and, and I think, but people who came in just as UX designers from the get go, how do you um, uh, tease out the need for the underlying structure to inform those flows and screens and all that stuff? It's really, really hard. And what I see a lot on projects when I, and when people are um, like either coming to a class or when I'm trying, you know, talking to, to, to folks on a new project is that they don't know what they haven't done um, and they don't know what's missing. And they've done the flows and they've done the screens and then some business analyst or developer saying, yeah, but. And they're like, oh, um, I, I was working with a project a couple of years ago where they're doing something fairly complex where they would 
try to deliver really good recommendations to people um, for a particular product. And they had a really good big idea. Um, and I'm like, but where's that data going to come from? Where are the classifications going to come from? How are we going to make sure that the way that we do those recommendations doesn't, you know, continue to um, reinforce, you know, structural bias? Um, and they're like, oh, no, well, we'll just, we'll just create the categories. We'll just make them. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't want to be like the grumpy old lady going, you can't just make them. These things don't just make themselves. I don't know, it's all right. We'll come up with the list. We'll make, we'll make you know, we'll, we'll come up with the things. So I'm like, you can't just come up with them. This is. But they couldn't understand how complex it was going to be. And I was like, this is not going to work. This is actually probably impossible. Really good big idea. So it falls apart and then what ends up happening is mediocre products get delivered or um, products that reinforce structural bias because nobody has understood the nature of the, you know, categories and algorithms and the way that, you know, that we bundle up stuff to deliver it automatically. That's right because you're... Yeah, you're making me think now about the evolution of metadata strategy. It used to be that you just categorize documents so you could spit them back out, but now you have to categorize at a different level so that you can put it together in a useful way. Is that a correct way to summarize that? Yeah, yeah. And, and so, like, uh, on all projects, everybody has a different kind of lens of how of what this might be. I've never actually worked somewhere where anybody called it metadata strategy, um, but, yes, absolutely. Right, because like you said, that the the like at some point a a, a, P, a product manager, somebody looks at it and goes, "Well, how are you going to do this?" And they're like, yes. "Well, they'll just go from this screen to this screen, or they'll." Uh, but it's like, "Well, and how exactly?" So, um, how exactly? Like exactly what is in that list of categories? Um, yeah. <laughs> exactly what is the metadata? So you're yeah. reminding me a little bit of like Brad Frost's atomic design or or, or approaches like that, where where you have to. Um, articulate what it is you're working. I guess maybe is that sort of what's going on here that you have to, the designers are thinking flows, they're thinking like in verbs and action and yeah. action. And what you're working with is things, nouns, objects. Yeah. Is that yeah. the is that the disconnect, do you think? That is a disconnect. And of course, there's like every project is a kind of different style. So we're being really abstract here and generalizing. But yeah, that's like a flow is about going from this screen to this screen to this screen and doing these things. But we're talking about the things. And in order to get the things onto the screen, often we need to have figured out how the things relate. Um, so, you know, you go to this screen to this screen and you've made some selections in the first one. What's going to be shown on the second one, for example? Or, um, you know, how what, what things are we showing there based on, you know, what we know about the person and what the situation is and what the content actually, you know, how it can work. So, yeah, yeah that's a really good summary of one way of thinking about um, t things about flows and steps. And I'm always thinking about the, um, you know, the nouns and the, and the relationships. Yeah, that's something, again, I'm thinking out loud here, but one of the big trends I think we're all seeing is this, that a lot of this has to do with decoupling, you know, decoupling of like content from documents, I think is the yeah. thing that's driving a lot of what we're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Is that an accurate way to think about it? Like, and how do you, and, I, and, and what you're talking about, like assembling the right thing in that flow mm -hmm. is sort of a recoupling in the moment. Is that... Yeah. Yeah, it recouples it in the moment because you, and you write the rules around it to say, show these things at this point debate based on all of these other things that might have happened. But I think the interesting thing here is that the skill set to do user research and understand your customer's journey now and understand a future customer journey and kind of set up those flows, like that is a particular set of skills and a way of thinking about the world that really probably isn't the same set of skills and the same style of brain as setting up the structure of the data so that it can turn up in the right place. And, you know, definitely some people can do both. I can definitely do both. I don't mm -hmm. do the make it look amazing bit, but I can definitely do the, you know, the flows and the structure. But um, thinking structurally... Uh, and thinking about, you know, content and metadata is really different. It really isn't the same as doing research and doing flows. Um, and so all the time we don't have those skills on a project, the work isn't happening well.
Right. Well, that goes back to something you said right when you were int- introducing your idea of IA that that it's it's a skill set. It's not necessarily a job title. Um, yep. So that so it can it can happen in any number of places, I guess. Well, and this kind of gets into I want to I want to make sure we talk about your role as an educator, and maybe this yep. is a good place to to talk about that because you've done a ton of workshops and courses and classes. You've, you've done everything over the years and written a book, multiple yeah, yeah. books. You know you you know how to impart this information as well as anyone. Uh, how do you help a non-specialist uh, cultivate IA skill sets? Oh, my, I still don't do it well. Um, I still, well, I mean, maybe people think that I do it well and they're happy when they leave, but I, if, maybe I shouldn't admit this out loud. Um, <laughs> whenever I'm teaching IA, I'm feeling inadequate the whole time. I'm feeling like I'm not explaining well, and this is what, why am I saying this is so hard, and how am I not getting it through? But then I like pull myself out of it. I'm like, actually, this is, I'm trying to describe a lot of things in a way that, um, you know, that people can apply them to their really specific projects. So, yeah, like I said, in the old days, I kind of taught people how to come up with hierarchies and categories. And now I'm having to teach them these kind of um, quite abstract, foundational, um, fundamental, like ways, ways that humans think and way that content models is how I teach IA. But, um, like, I just never actually have time to do it well. I often end up doing, like, one- and two-day workshops, and it's not, I mean, that's how education works, and professionals often don't get time to really immerse, and there's no complaining there. But it means I have to kind of land as much, um, fundamentals and basics in people's heads and hope that they can make sense with the things I give them later on to a project. Yeah, and the way you just said that, it's that combination of, wait, I just started to note to myself, well, it's, it's that combination of the human behavior well, yeah. and I guess, well, I, I want to go back because your book, I mean, you were doing this years ago because your book, the first chapter is sort of an overview, but the second chapter or part is, is about pe- the people part of it. And yeah. so, and, and it's sort of like the journey stuff is people stuff. And then the structure stuff is content and, and other and data uh, in there. Um, it, do people have so, trouble stitching those together? Like they're, they're the behavioral stuff. I, that sounds like what's going on here or part of it anyway. Right. Yeah. yeah, well, to understand the people stuff, you not only have to understand what people need to achieve, you know, in a task, um, we need to understand fundamentally how people think. So when I teach IA, the core thing that I've taught every single class for probably close to 20 years is I always start with teaching category theory. And I'm like, I am not apologising for teaching you about Aristotle um, and then teaching you why Aristotle was wrong. Uh, but why it has leaked into our whole way of thinking about the world. Um, Because Aristotelian philosophy um, believes that there is a, you know, a correct way of structuring information that's out in the world and you go get it and you, like, apply it. And actually categories form in our brains based on our experiences. And our experiences, um, you know, are formed by our communities and our language and everything we've done. So the way that, you know, categories and categories and concepts and thought, you know, the way we kind of bundle stuff in our heads um, is really varied across different cultures and communities. Um, So we're trying to look for coherence in a particular, you know, user group that we're working for um, in a particular way, you know, some way that we can bridge a gap for them of, you know, understanding where they are now and where they need to be based on how they think and what they think about. Um, and uh, and that's, that's, it's not hard, hard, but it needs work and it needs an understanding that people think about things in really different ways. And, like, I think uh, one, one of the little examples of this um, in knowing a little about you know, in travelling to the US a lot and travelling to Europe and travelling to South America, is you, want, you like, you know, that, that, that idea of politeness and um, the way that people, you know, interact with each other, you can see that's really different culturally um, and, you know, the way that you say, yes, I'll, you know, if you offer somebody something in some cultures, they're like, sure, fine. And then some, they're, oh, no, I can't possibly. And you do that whole routine. Um, and so you think about that, that idea and then every, apply that to everything that we 
deal with, you can see that we think really differently. It's embedded deep in our brains and then we're trying to bridge, um, you know, some kind of getting people through a task or helping them learn with our content. So you really have to understand all those people things and then figure out how you can apply that well to the content that you're working with. Um, and that just needs work. Like it isn't just a, I'm going to do some navigation design today. I'm going to make up some half-assed categories. <laughs> well, no, there's so much in what you just said. And it, it's like, I'm going to forgive you, you know, for thinking you're not a good teacher when you're teaching IA. Because just what you just ran through there in the last two minutes is like human psychology and human behavior and the history of philosophy. And, you know, it's like, there's a lot going on here. But I want to thank you for a couple of things. One, you gave me the great clickbait um, thing for when I promote this episode that Aristotle was wrong and will lead with it. <laughs> so, so that's great. But also when you were talking about like, just those ways of organizing things like, you know, that, that gets it both again, some of that research stuff around grasping mental models and, and trying yeah. to get inside your user's head. But then it also, but that equally applies on the organization and structuring end when you're doing mm -hmm. your, your information architecture. Um, how have you seen, because I've been doing, like I'm personally, I'm studying ontology engineering and ontology uh -huh. practice right now and really uh, seeing benefit in that, whether I ever actually do that just for my information architecture practice. Um, but there's other ways, there's other approaches to, um, organizing the work of figuring out how people think, you know, does that make sense? And how do you do that? Oh, I probably do it different on every project, I think. Um, I don't know that I have a, I don't know that I have a repeatable, rigorous way of doing it. Um, you know, so and I just talked about all that stuff and you can tell it's all in my head. So I, because I have that all in my head and I'm, you know, good at understanding content and structure, I can put things together. Like I can just go from that kind of jigsaw mess of things I know about people and things I know about content to making a leap to, you know, coming up with something. Um, but that's because I've been doing it for 20 years. Uh, and I, and that, again, that's why sometimes I find it hard and I feel inadequate teaching because uh, it's hard to go backwards and break it down into a process. Right. And that's, yeah. And um, we all, I mean, that's how, that's how I learn as I teach, you know, because then you have to do what you just said. You have to break it down and make it learnable. Um, mm. But I guess if you could, if you, when you reflect on all, and, and also what you're saying about, like when you were talking about all the, just the human variety across the globe. And I'm like, holy crap, mm. that's a whole other episode just about localization and information architecture and, and yeah. all that. But so much of this is about, but ultimately that's about, you know, the basics of communication, like knowing your audience or your users in a UX practice um, and then addressing it to them. So thinking of like, if you can, <laughs> like a, 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 the, the most generic persona you can conjure up in the moment, what would be the two, top two or three take homes you would give to hope that someone would leave your courses with about the practice of information architecture? Uh, I think that a couple of take homes are that we think in different ways. If you can at least understand that actually thinking deeply um, is different across cultures and um, communities, that's amazing. Like, that's amazing to go, oh, right, we actually don't think even similarly. Good, I need to know that and then I can apply it. So there's just like learning that is good. Um, I think the other, the other real takeaway when I'm trying to teach is to help, and, and you and I talked before about um, uh, we're talking about content modeling. The other takeaway is to help people understand how to go about trying to understand and model or represent the thing that they're working. With. Um, so I I always get get people to do an activity where I usually give them I usually say um, uh, you're working for a games store, uh, whether that's an online game store or a you know face to face physical game store, it doesn't matter. Think about all of the kind of things that they sell. So here, game stores will sell board games and puzzles and, you know, Dungeons, Dragons books and figurines. And then if you add computer games in, then there's like games and consoles and stuff. So you think about all the things that they might sell. And then I get them to start drawing a model of that. And I really help, I, I encourage them to think about the relationships between things. And, um, you know, and I usually um, prime them with some examples like, 
not just board games and puzzles, but like what do you do about, um, you know, brands like Marvel? So you might have, you know, a Marvel board game, you might have a Marvel puzzle, you might have a Marvel, um, um, you know, digital game, you might have figurines, you might have something else. Or how do you go about, um, you know, thinking about um, other kind of aspects of that? And the, th the thing that works really well in a workshop setting there is people start with the kind of, or, you know, things that are the nouns, the board games and puzzles, and then they start thinking about what, is, what are those things about and how do we represent how they would relate to each other. And then they, like, tie themselves in knots trying to figure out what the hell they're doing anyway and why did I ask them to do this, which is exactly what they need to, like, that's the process they need to go through to go, oh, hang on, what are we doing here and why? And when they walk away with that, going, uh, what, are we, what are we doing here, why? Okay, now I need to think about my project and what do I really need to do? What do I need to understand? What are the kind of content objects we're working with and what relationships do we need to know about? Um, because it's easy to make a, you know, a, no, it's not, not easy. Um, it's easy to accidentally try to make a model of everything you know and, mm -hmm. you know, just, to <laughs> blow it out. So you pull it back and say, for my project, for the things that we're trying to achieve here, how much do we need to, to work with? So if people walk out of a workshop with those two things um, and enough of like, okay, cool, that was interesting. I, I have a feeling that I'll try that on my next project. I'm good. Great. I hope this helps people because yeah, I, I, yeah, I see a lot of need for this. You know, one, one thing you've mentioned the word model several times and it occurs yeah. to me when I reflect on this conversation that like, you know, I think a lot about content modeling and, and domain modeling and, um, mm. but also like, you know, like customer journey mapping or user journey maps, that's modeling a journey or modeling. Yeah. You know, it's like everything we're doing, we're ma mapping mental models, you know, to understand people or empathy mapping is kind of trying to map, you know, the, the feeling part of the brain, yeah. you know. Uh, so do, do you see modeling as like a core skill for information architects? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I actually have a degree in economics, uh, and, you know, one of the things that we just learned really early on was about making models of the world. Like, that's what economics does. Um, and I was, I, was doing a, I was doing a talk a couple of years ago and I, I realised finally that other people don't know what models are. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and what we're trying to do here is go from a messy complexity of the world and represent it in some way so that we can use that to make decisions or to talk with other people or help, help others understand what we're working with and so that we can use that to, you know, actually build our projects. So being able to um, model, whether that's, you know, content modelling or domain modelling, like you said, or, um, you know, journey maps are models because you're trying to figure out how to represent something that's actually pretty complex and that probably isn't linear and that everybody does differently in a way that you can communicate, you know, and, and find places in there to do, do various things. So these are all models. Um, and I think it's a pretty fundamental skill and I reckon it's probably not taught like that. It's probably taught like, you know, you should do, and I, I certainly t I teach UX and in the courses that I teach, which I don't write the content for, it's basically like go and do a journey map, but nobody actually, they, they don't talk about like what is happening underneath there. Right. I guess that's what got me thinking about it is that like, mm -hmm. and I, anyway, like I was just thinking out loud there, but it seems like that uh, taking these skills that we apply and just applying them to each part of that, each of the things you've talked about today. So. Yeah, yeah, I can't yeah. believe this. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was talking to somebody the other day, somebody in one of my classes just about different thinking styles. And somebody said to me, like, it said that she has um, had just been diagnosed with ADHD and we were talking about um, just different thinking styles. And some people can't make models. Like, to some doing that, and I'm not, I'm not trying to draw a bridge between ADHD and making models. I was just like, we were just mm -hmm. having a general conversation about different styles of thinking and what works. Um, some people can't do it. they like, okay, but... What are we doing here? And some people are really good at taking something abstract and turning it into a representation. So, um, you know, if it's not your skill, then that's okay. Find somebody who is good at doing, making models and frameworks 
and kind of, you know, making people who are good at making process and understanding how to, you know, abstract a process can be good at this as well. Great. That's, that's perfect. Hey, I can't believe it. We're coming up close to time already. It always goes so quick, but hey, I want to make sure if, there, if there's anything last, anything that's come up in the conversation that you want to make sure you follow up on, or just anything that's on your mind that you want to share with the folks. I want to make sure no, you get a chance. That's a lot of things that are on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> they revolve around paint and, uh, and plumbing. Um, but so it's worth me mentioning that the book you mentioned um, is called the, the non-card sorting one. It's called A Practical Guide to Information Architecture. And it um, is on my website for free because my distributor decided not to sell it anymore and gave me no notice. And I'm like, what am I going to do with this? It's old. It's still good. You can just have it for free. Um, sometimes people ask me if, um, you know, they can, you know, throw some money at me. I'm like, I have no way of doing that. Go buy one of my other books. Um, at, at the same time. So that you can have a free book and go buy another book, like buy my one on you know, presenting design or something um, uh, as a way to, you know, pop some money in my bank. <laughs> but, yeah, it's worth people knowing that book is there just for, for having. Um, I wrote it just before we really started working on mobile. So it's, you know, got, a, got some huge gaps. But it's still got lots of good fundamentals and uh, they can learn about why Aristotle was wrong. I flipped through it again, um, you know, in the couple last couple of weeks, and it's still really good. It holds up really well. So <laughs> I think it's and it's it's worth way more than free. So I'll include links to your other books to make sure that other people have a chance to support you uh, as well. Hey, one last thing, uh, Donna, uh, what's the best way for folks to follow you or stay in touch on social media or online anywhere? Probably LinkedIn is best. Um so I use Twitter, but just not a lot anymore. I'm, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. I'm there, you know, there a lot. Um, I do get a lot of request connections. So the thing I do ask people is, please say to me, hey, I heard you on Larry's podcast and I'd love to connect because that means I'll actually connect. The other um, 300 in my inbox, um, I just, I'll do it one day. Um, and you can find me easily on LinkedIn just as Donna Spencer, like it'll be LinkedIn, whatever, whatever, Donna Spencer. I can send you the link. Okay. And I'll put the link in the, in the show notes as well. So, yeah. yeah. Well, the other places I'm mad Donna with two A's, um, like on Twitter and other, other oh, places. Oh, right. Yeah. M-A-A-D, Donna. M-A-A-D. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll make sure that's a link too as well. Well, thanks so much, Donna. I really enjoyed this conversation. Super fun. Thank you very much. Really good to talk to you as well. Thank you for listening. If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next content strategy interview.